healthy ecologies are systems in which the organisms are constantly and almost sort of perfectly at each other's throats. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. We're going to continue exploring the facet of the balance of power in the wild, the kinds of power struggles that happen between animals. We explored this earlier with Lee Allen DeGatkin, the behavioral ecologist, author of Power in the Wild. But as I introduce you to our next guest, I want to ease into things, not going immediately for the jugular, like some wild animal. My preface to this next section is a story that I told to our next guest, and I want you to hear it too. At first blush, it's wholly unrelated to the drama of wild power, but you'll see. When my children were younger, we frequently found ourselves on hikes out in the nearby mountains and canyons. And frequently we played this game. We called it Smith's Sticks, Stones, and Streams. The way you play Smith's Sticks, Stones, and Streams is very straightforward. First, you're a smith, and once you've met that qualification, you move sticks and stones around in some babbling stream. The more time at your disposal, the better. And by the way, our family word for a babbling stream is a blurb you buy. Well, you, you never seek to win at this game because it's already a win just to be where you are with raw elements of the world that you can touch and move and arrange, move them about. Little rivulets get combined into a mighty torrent, or maybe you divide the torrent into little rivulets. You divert water from its original course. How do you do this with dams and jetties? The sticks, the stones, you, you watch the way the water moves, what it carries, how fast or slow things happen. What's living there, in, on, or around the whole place? But above, above everything else, you intervene. You get your hands wet. You get your toes and your feet wet. And the whole enterprise is really quite harmless. I don't think we ever pushed the limits of what the U.S. Forest Service would deem to be acceptable there. Uh, we worked together at what was non-work, playing but busy as beavers, and it had immense and simple joys. Now, I need to say this. If somewhere in that water, tiny organisms were going at each other, if there were anything approaching the drama or violence that Lee Allen Dugat can describe for us, well, we Smiths, with our sticks and stones, did not stick around long enough to see anything untoward. Besides, those battles would have been almost too tiny to see, and we didn't have the luxury of doing that kind of close observation. But our next guest did. I want you to meet Adam Nicholson, who I have to say took Smith's stick, stones, and streams to a whole new level, constructing tidal pools at the edge of the sea. He did this in a deep inlet, saltwater inlet in Scotland called a loch. The thing that drew him there was more than just a frolicking kind of childlike curiosity. He wanted to build pools that would become entire worlds in and of themselves, just to see what might happen in them. Adam Nicholson is a preeminent English author who has written on topics ranging from great literature and land and seascape to the making of the King James Bible. When I caught up with him at his farm in Sussex, England, I told him about Smith Stick Stones and Streams, and his response reveals that he's more than just a little familiar with getting his feet wet and a little bit of uh, nature between his toes. There obviously is something incredibly childish about wanting to um, muck about, as we say in English, uh, in English, English, in the water. But obviously, as you say, as wonderful thing about water is that it's so malleable. It's so ready to be directed. It's so happy to run, pool, you know, gather, disperse and... It's, just, it's not like mud, is it? Or, I mean, it's not like gardening. Gardening always fills me with despair. It's so static. But if you, if you play with water, water kind of gives life back. The life that comes back at you is the reason you go out there in the first place. Yes, well, I mean, the thing about uh, this zone between high and low tide is that it is really, well, I think for me, the most revelatory habitat on Earth, that simply because twice a day, every day, 
an entirely hidden world, a world that kind of operates to completely different physics and and chemistries even. That different world is revealed twice a day. And so twice a day, this book is open to you. It says to you, look at this. What on earth is this? Nicholson made his own tide pools, his revelatory tide pools. I say revelatory. He made them by hand, made them large, digging with a pickaxe, using concrete when he deemed it necessary. The place he chose to play this game, a tidal zone between sea and land on the western coast of Scotland. So, yes, it involved water like the Smith's Affair, but he was experimenting with much bigger waters than my American landlocked clan often gets to play in. Now, consider this. Maybe you get down on your hands and knees once or twice a summer to build some sand castles with the kids. But Nicholson made this his everyday work. He was building and observing small, wet, briny worlds. And if you're tempted to think he's sort of a Peter Pan type, stuck in childhood, well, uh, actually, I'm not going to fault him a bit. Not for contriving his own kind of wonderland. I should say Neverland. It's Alice in Wonderland, Peter in Neverland. Uh, But this show endorses childlike wonder. Here's the curious thing in this. For all that he undertook in building these little worlds, and which to me sounds so idyllic, what he discovered in the process was actually very much parallel to what Lee Allen de Gatkin in our last conversation has found about the natural world, the push and the pull of it all, the struggles, the battles, the not-so-very-idyllic clashes that keep our world or even small worlds, in any semblance of balance. And Nicholson became fairly obsessed. He started to care in a deeply personal kind of way about these struggles, these creatures. He let himself become affected by creatures like winkles, a type of snail, and limpets, another type of snail but with a shell more like a clam's. And just hang on if you think that I'm overstating the potential allure of slimy, shelly, smelly, snaily organisms. When you read what Nicholson has written about these in his book Life Between the Tides, it takes no time at all to see that he is transfixed by all this life going on. You know, we are really not like a prawn or or a winkle or or a limpet. And we are, you know, curiously like a, a fox or even a bird. You know, there are clearly things that that connect us to to those creatures. But to these animals of the intertidal, I think it's something like 700 million years of evolution separates me or you from a prawn. And that gap is a gap that is longing to be filled, or is longing to be filled with curiosity, really. Because, you know, you pour in curiosity into the thing that, into this gap that that revelation opens up for you. And I think that's that's really what this book is about. It's what on earth is this? I do want to talk to you about what on earth a prawn is, what on earth a sand hopper is, what what on earth a biofilm is, something so small none of us really see it with our eyes very much. Uh, before we do, could you just situate us in this place in Scotland because it's a it's a place I've never been and it seems like a fairly harsh environment In even before you get to the sea, the, the land, the place, uh, the people there? Yeah, it's a hard place. It's um, the west coast of Scotland is mountainous. The, the mountains, well, in in British terms, they're kind of three thousand, two two three thousand feet high only. But uh, it's northern mountains come down to the sea to sea lochs. These kind of deep uh, channels of water that that interpenetrate the land, and so it's a kind of it's very extreme. You either have mountain which is acid, bog, most of it, very difficult to cultivate, very poor place. People have always been very poor there. Uh, and this this uh, often very wild northern sea. And so it's a bit of the earth where extremes are in play. And it's, so it's very exciting. It's very beautiful. And it's very uninhabited. It's empty. The thing about the bay is this very, very beautiful bay, you know, filled with, with dolphins and basking sharks and wonderful uh, waterfalls coming down to it, a medieval castle on, on one side, these beautiful ancient uh, oak woodlands. Um, and the, 
the thing about it that I always missed was it had no tidal pools because the geology is volcanic and very rubbly. The rock does not make the kind of tidal pools that you find, you know, in in, in other uh, sort of limestoney or sandstoney places. And so I thought, why not make some? Why not actually make some tidal pools and see what the sea delivered? And to try to understand in that sort of slowly accumulating way what life actually consisted of, what life was, how did life work, uh, how do the different forms of life reflect the, these conditions that uh, the sea and the rocks give them. And so that's what I did. And so it was like a, an experiment on a new planet. It was trying to kind of be on Earth as if I'd never been on Earth before. And I think that that is this kind of deep motivation behind a long, and very wet, very dirty process. This is entirely an exercise in bioreceptivity, just saying to other creatures, come and be in the pool, or even bioreciprocity, that I was adventuring into the pool at the same time as they were, that we were kind of encountering each other in, this, in these invented places. As the tides of the North Atlantic rise and fall, one of the creatures sure to be encountered there on the coast of Scotland is the sand hopper, sometimes called a beach flea. They're only about a quarter of an inch long. A sand hopper is a, a little crustacean. It's like a tiny shrimp, really, but based in the deliciously dark, wet, sludgy mass of rotting seaweed on a beach. When I was young, I was always rather disgusted by them. You know, that when you, when you pick away a lump of seaweed at the head of the beach, it does seem like a vision of hell, really, when you open that mound up. And these little creatures come jumping out at you. But when you kind of dare to look in a way, and that's what this whole enterprise is about, is daring to look, uh, it's miraculous. They have this wonderful thing called the protean escape, you know, where uh, a group of them will deliberately jump in every and any direction so that the predators, usually a shorebird picking about for some protein, is confused and can't catch, catch even one of them. Uh, the protean escape. And um, it's just got a magic bit of kind of genetic intelligence to know that if they all jumped in one direction, obviously the oyster catcher would have them for lunch. This survival mechanism in the face of predation, that's one thing. But sandhoppers also have another amazing ability. Quite incredibly, a sandhopper knows where the sea is. If you put a sandhopper down and the tide is coming in, it will jump away from the tide. And extraordinarily, if you uh, get a sandhopper from a west-facing beach and put that sandhopper on an east-facing beach, the sandhopper thinks it's still on its west-facing beach. And instead of jumping away from the sea, it jumps towards the sea. So... The sandhopper has understood, in other words, where it is. It, it has a geography. But even more amazingly, if you breed together a west-facing beach sandhopper with an east-facing beach sandhopper, their children, or well, children, their progeny, jump either north or south, i.e. halfway between the directions that its parents knew. So this, this sense of geography, this understanding of the world is genetically embedded in these tiny creatures, these tiny little, they're like tiny prawns. So what does that start to do with your idea of what other animals are? You know, they are not merely meat. They're not, they're not merely uh, annoyances to people clear sandhoppers away from beaches because they're not good business. They are actually thinking, conscious beings. And if you take a prawn 
this is an incredible experiment done by a French professor, Pascal Fossat, in Bordeaux. And Professor Fossat took some prawns and looked after them very carefully. So I think they were actually crayfish, relations of prawns, but effectively prawns. Put them in, in an underwater maze, some arms of which were light and some of which were dark. And if the prawns were completely calm before we put them in the maze, they explored everywhere. They're curious animals. They like to know what's going on. But if, as he did with some of them, uh, they had had a mild electric shock from a torch battery uh, beforehand, and he put them in the maze, the prawns would not explore the well-lit arms of the maze. They remained hidden, cowering, you could say, in the dark arms. And if he then took those shocked prawns and gave them injections of the anti-anxiety drug, uh, benzodiazepine, the prawns behaved as if everything was absolutely okay. And they explored everywhere. They went into all the arms of the maze. So what does this tell you? It means that a prawn, the prawns that had had a shock, could remember the shock. And so we're in a state of anxiety because of it. In other words, they could remember the past, but they could also imagine the future. They weren't faced with any kind of current threat. They thought maybe there was something around the corner which might hurt them. So in other words, prawns have an imagination. Maybe prawn can dream. Maybe prawns have nightmares. I mean, I love a prawn sandwich as, as much as the next man. But uh, I think that it's that kind of extremely close attention that really transforms one's relationship to the world. That if you look that closely, of course, you end up caring. And the prawns in, in my pools, I looked at them and imagined them having this imaginative life. There was a particular encounter you had with a prawn. You write that it was injured, and you spent considerable time with that creature. Yes, well, one of the things about these rock pools is that you become very familiar with them, visiting them day after day. And in one of the pools, one of the prawns was clearly out of kilter. They have these little balancing cells on their legs called statoses, brilliant little mechanisms which allow them to know when they're floating level and how to readjust themselves so they are level. But this one prawn could never quite balance itself and was swimming around the pool day after day, slightly tipped to the right. And you know how it is with an animal, when you see an animal with a, a disability, it summons a kind of tenderness in you, well, it does in me anyway. You kind of see this thing, and obviously it's a rough old world in, in the rock pool. Uh, it's highly competitive and dangerous, you know, lots of predators in there. And so the fact that this little disabled prawn was maintaining its life as best it could in circumstances which... You know, Darwinian science would say, well, you know, you're not long for the world, mate, uh, was I find incredibly touching. And it's, it does, in some ways, seem crazy to feel touched by the life of a prawn. A prawn I would very happily eat for, for lunch. Uh, but these uh, creatures' ability to steer their own destinies in a way is what got to me that here were beings that just as much as you, you or I were coping with life's hazards and, and life's pains as best they could. And I think that shared sense of being on the world is really one of the best things I got from this whole project, that we, you and I, Marcus, we're not unlike the prawns. We're like the prawns. And once you recognize you're like the prawns, then in fact an entire philosophical vision flows from that. You start to think that you're not distinct, you're not the kind of apex of evolution, the great kind of dominating final glorious feature that 
uh, enlightenment civilization tells us we are, but we're co-actors in the world with these things. Part of my aim in visiting with Adam Nicholson was to try to gauge just how far his empathy could really go. How minutely particular, minutely attentive can he be? And I'm delighted to report that he can go much smaller than prawns. He's just as enthralled with the microscopic foundations of life as he is with hungry mouths further up the food chain, larger mouths. He finds deep significance, high drama, if you will, in barely detectable biofilm, invisible, slimy cities of microbes. Well, what biology is called biofilm is the layers of microscopic life, tiny, tiny bacterial and subbacterial life that gathers in any uh, nutritious environment. And so when you wake up in the morning and there's a slight kind of thickness on your teeth before you brush your teeth, that is actually a film of uh, miniature life. It is this biofilm. And in any any tide pool, in any sea pool, that film will gather. And on it, any number of organisms feed. Of course, it's a sort of, it's a crop, it's a lawn that you can you can move your mower through. And so you can you can watch the, the creatures, you can watch the winkles, the limpets, you know, maneuvering through this nutritious world. And it is the absolute foundation, the diatoms, the the tiniest things which we can't see with the naked eye that are or constitute the basement on which the rest of this more complex life uh, stands. And so, in a way, unless you have biofilm, you don't have anything else. And of course, you know, pollution incidents, that is the first thing that gets destroyed. If you have a slick of oil or of oil dispersants or any, any number of sort of concentrated chemicals, then the biofilm is wiped off the rocks. Uh, and so then you don't get winkles, you don't get limpets, you don't get anything that feeds on them, and all the trophic layers above disappear. The biofilm is what we all rely on in the end. So you've already pulled us in the direction of another story that is very important to what you've written, the Torrey Canyon spill, and the idea that uh, that grand catastrophe, which I'd love to have you tell us a little bit about, uh, one of the first great oil disasters at sea, in a way that relates to the disruption of the life of biofilm if there are pollutants that kill off a population. Yes, it was early on in the 1967, I think, when uh, the first super tankers were careering around the world. And uh, a huge one, I think it had 17 thousand tons of Kuwaiti crude on board was wrecked on some rocks off the southwest corner of, of England in Cornwall or between Cornwall and the Scilly Isles and vast quantities of the oil spread out. Very large numbers of seabirds were killed and the British government was very anxious that it, this happened in the spring of the year that the holiday season that we, on which the whole economy of southwest England relies would be ruined because all the beaches would be covered in oil. And so they got these very primitive um, dispersant chemicals, which you know, no one would dream of using them now, and chuck them in the sea, chuck them off cliffs to try and get rid of the oil, disperse the oil. But it turned out that those chemicals were even more polluting than the oil itself and made a kind of um, impermeable slick on the surface of the sea. And it was utterly, utterly catastrophic. It, first of all, killed all of those animals that we've just been talking about, particularly the limpet population. The seaweeds just absolutely boomed. And there were enormous forests of seaweed off the coast of Cornwall that year because there were no limpets to eat them. Since then, extraordinarily, it hasn't ever really recovered, but has maintained a very severe boom-bust pattern where sometimes the, the weed booms into giant peaks, sometimes the limpets boom and eat it down to nothing, and now, what are we, where is 60 years later? And so the, the implication of that is that 
no coastal environment is going to be in good state unless the organisms that make up the ecology of it are themselves in tension. If you change circumstances so that, for example, the predators can't survive, the limpets can't survive, or you change circumstances where there are so many predators that what they prey on, the prey species, the the weeds can't survive, then you get this completely unstable oscillation. Healthy ecologies are systems in which the organisms are constantly and almost sort of perfectly at each other's throat. (laughs) That it isn't a picture of harmony, it's a picture of tense balance. The early Greek philosopher Heraclitus, he has this wonderful and extraordinary phrase that strife is justice. That only if things are in tension do you actually get a kind of coherent world. If one element in a system becomes overweening, overbearing, overdominant, then the system itself collapses. You need strife to have harmony. It's the strangest paradox. And you witnessed this with your own eyes in those small pools. You didn't have to go down to Cornwall and see the Torrey Canyon spill and and the, the boom and bust cycle down there. There was boom and bust right there between, I don't know, crabs and other creatures. Obviously, uh, an ecology with internal tensions is an absolutely constant picture of a crab winning out over a winkle or one kind of sea anemone is winning out over another. And so you have a constant tussle in which there are minor victories, minor in, in spatial scale and minor in temporal scale. And so there is an odd sort of central paradox to this that oscillation and change at a certain scale is stability. That if you attempt actual stasis, you know, actually nothing happening, then you will end up with a kind of oscillating catastrophe. If you allow multiple changes to ripple through a system the whole time, you get a kind of coherent stability. You know, there are such huge implications that come from that about the way in which societies might work or even international relations might work or a market might work or or even a, a, a marriage might work, <laughs> that this seems to be an absolutely universal rule that minor oscillation is happiness or is justice. So I sit down to read your book and in the very first pages, I read about a man who goes to make some ponds in a way it seems your initial project was to mirror the stillness between the tides. As the tides uh, have ceased coming in and get ready to go out, uh, there's a stasis that seems to happen, and and, and you liked that. And in the end, uh, you're defeated because within your pond, there's no stillness. There's this tension. There's this crab and winkle battle going on and the ripples you're talking about, which, which you say are actually healthy. We've all had a pretty grievous few years recently, have we not? And perhaps there is an everlasting longing and desire in all of us for, you know, the place of calm, the the place of Arcadian stillness where everything is all right, where there is no tension, where there is no threat. And I think definitely in some ways one of the motives for doing this was If you made a pool, have a smaller pool, the size of this room I'm I'm sitting in, it would become a, a little Edenic, little paradise away from the hurly burly. Uh but you're right though, that I un came to understand that that was illusory and that was a false ideal, and that actually the vitality of life is the oscillation. The reason that life is marvelous is that it's open-ended. This open-ended struggle between species sometimes results in evolutionary configurations that really don't seem all that much different from how humans are known to operate. In just a moment, we're going to hear from Adam Nicholson how in their behaviors, crabs and snails have something in common with human armies that send soldiers to war.
I'm Marcus Smith. English author Adam Nicholson's latest book, Life Between the Tides, is replete with example after example of how the interactions of living things are of necessity and existentially anything but idyllic or serene. A winkle and a green shore crab are a complete enemies, or at least the crab wants to eat the winkles. And the winkles have developed very brilliant uh, sensory mechanisms to deal with a crab. They can smell, well, underwater, the smell and taste senses are the same. So they can smell slash taste the presence of a crab in the pool. It's urine, probably. And so when a crab is in a pool, winkles leave. They crawl up the side of the um, of the pool, up onto the rocks, or into cracks where a crab can't get them. People have done very good <laughs> measurements of this. How fast does a winkle usually move? And I can't remember the figures offhand, but very, very slow. <laughs> and when a, when a crab appears in a the pool, then a winkle moves a lot faster, maybe three times as fast, maybe an inch a minute or something. But obviously a crab can run much faster than that. A crab can really run quite quickly. And so uh, the winkles know when a crab is there. Winkles also know if a crab have been in water and it isn't there any longer, they can still detect the crab. So as soon as the crab turns up, they head for the hills, their cracks or their, their safe havens. But a crab could very easily catch a winkle. So what's going on? It turns out that small winkles, a crab doesn't bother with because basically it's hardly worth crushing the cell to get the tiny amount of meat inside. The very old winkles, the winkles usually develop too strong a shell for your average crab to crush, and so they are fine. It's not even worth a crab attacking an old winkle. It is worthwhile attacking a kind of young adult which hasn't developed this enormously thick shell yet. And so a crab goes for one of these midstream winkles, which it easily catches, and usually takes, in some, these are all averages, but usually takes about 10 minutes to get into the meat of the winkle and eat it. Now, it so happens that about 10 minutes is also the length of the time that most of the other winkles need to get into places of safety. In other words, the shell of the winkle, the average age winkle, will not in the end protect that winkle from the crab. It will die. But the time it takes for the crab to get into that winkle saves the lives of the other winkles. In other words, that winkle that dies is sacrificed for the benefit of the winkle society as a whole. It is, in a way, the soldier who is sent out to defend the community from the attacker and dies in the process. And so this is, this is an extraordinary bit of evolution to me that somehow Winkles have developed a system which is not unlike our own of recruiting an army of young, willing males to go and defend us against enemies who would otherwise destroy us all. When we recruit an army, when we fund at enormous expense our armed forces, we are in a sense doing no more than what that group of winkles in the tide pool are doing. This would indeed be a brutal way to end our conversation and very bleak, were it not for one thing that I keep thinking about, which is that in this whole pattern of sacrificial offerings so that others can live, so that others can flourish, uh, there's, there's this concept of a welcoming space for life to be very busy and to conduct this strife you're talking about. And, and, and you have introduced me to a term bioreceptivity, the idea that when you went to make your pools, you were putting out a welcome mat. You were wanting to make a place bioreceptive, which is to say what? It's to say that um, on so many fronts... What are we, and I am as hypocritical as the rest of us in this, and take my share of responsibility. What we have done over my lifetime of the last 50 years has been so destructive of other uh, forms of life on Earth that 
sixty percent of all wild vertebrates have gone. You know, something like well over ninety eight percent of all seabirds have plastic in their guts, and so on and so forth. We know these stories, and so I think this was an exercise for me, really, in saying um, what happens when you try to turn that process upside down, even on this utterly minute scale. Clearly, you know, this is, this is not a world-changing thing to do. But uh, if you create a place, if you sort of, if you make a, a space in which life can find the niches it needs to thrive, then that is an unalloyed good at whatever scale. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that I have been totally changed, to my surprise, by this process. I genuinely view things in a different way now. So you would recommend, perhaps, that Marcus go out and find a space, however small, and somehow set conditions, intervene in the world in a way that I could produce this unalloyed good you're talking about? I absolutely do. I live on a very tiny farm in the south of England, and we have been farming beef and sheep here for 30 years now, and I'm now going to turn the whole thing over to wild creatures. And in a stroke of good luck, a government agency in the UK is providing a subvention for the rewilding of Adam Nicholson's farm. Kind of reminds me of how his grandparents' world-renowned castle and garden called Sissinghurst is now sustained by the National Trust. That's a charity for historic preservation, not rewilding, historic preservation. Good cause, too. But here where I live in Utah, without any large farm to rewild of my own, nor any public funding, I have in recent years taken to heart everything implied by that word bioreceptivity. I take satisfaction and find joy. I really find joy in touching and shaping certain aspects of my environment, not just with sticks and stones and mountain streams, but uh, right at home in our Smith family yard and garden. How does a person make a small space more welcoming to wild life forms? I'm talking everything from fungus and plant life to microbes, insects, birds, reptiles, small mammals. I'm not so fond of the deer eating my grapes, but uh, Nicholson says this can be done at any scale, even in miniature. Be advised, though. To do this effectively, you're probably going to have to slow down, become a little more observant, maybe more reflective, more present to the wonders that surround us. It's fairly risky business, and now you have been forewarned. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. If by any chance you take up the challenge laid down here by Adam Nicholson, we would love to hear about it. You can email us directly. It's constantwonder at byu.edu. This episode was produced by Tenery Taylor, Daniel McDonald, and Mamie Teeples. Special thanks to Parker Schmidt and Mitchell Towsley and the sound design team at BYU Broadcasting. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. BYU Radio.